Welcome everyone to this month's discussion on an interesting article published in the current issue of Neurogastroenterology and Motility Journal. My name is Dr. Purna Kashyap. I'm a gastroenterologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. David Leventhal. Dr. Leventhal is an assistant professor in the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And he serves as the director of Neurogastroenterology and Motility Center at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He also directs the program for gut brain health and integrative behavioral gastroenterology clinic for patients with functional GI and motility disorders. Um, he leads an active uh, research program spanning clinical translation and basic science approaches aimed at understanding the neural basis of mind body interactions and their role in determining uh, states of gastrointestinal health and disease. He has a keen interest in cyclic vomiting syndrome and he helped create the first clinical guidelines for the management uh, of clinical vomiting syndrome in adults. Today, he joins us to discuss his recent paper, Greater Intolerance to Uncertainty Predicts Poorer Quality of Life in Adults with Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome, which is published in the current issue of Neurogastroenterology and Motility. Welcome, Dr. Leventhal, and thank you for joining us for this chat today. Oh, no, thank you, uh, Dr. Kashyap, for uh, the invitation. So it's really a pleasure to be here and, and share um, some uh, information about our publication. Great, and so we can just get right into that. Um, sure. I just wanted to start with uh, with some background on the paper, and you know, if you could just um, lay out for our audience uh, the importance uh, of this area, um, and you know, somewhat of the epidemiology and why you decided to undertake this study. Sure. Um, no, I, thank you for that question. So I think there's um, an increasing appreciation that um, cyclic vomiting syndrome (CVS). Uh, is a disorder that actually affects many more people than I think were ever uh, recognized in the past. Uh, this is a disorder that can appear de novo in adulthood. Um, it was classically felt to be a pediatric illness uh, where it affects probably one or 2% of children. Um, but it's only in the most recent uh, few decades that it's even been recognized as a disorder in, in adults. Um, the Rome uh, Committee uh, that uh, defines you know, disorders of brain-gut interaction um, and, and defines these syndromes has uh, really codified CVS as an illness in the, in the most uh, last couple of Rome criteria. Um, and it's actually really emerging how common CVS really is in, in adults. It, um, large surveys that have been published uh, uh, have the estimate as high as 2% of adults, which is pretty astounding if you think about how common that may be. Uh, and if you really think about your patient panel and you know common experience, we probably don't see two percent of our uh, patients as having you know re refractory CVS. But it actually probably is much more common than we recognize because I think cyclic vomiting syndrome in adults has a lot of different variations. There can be mild forms, moderate forms. I think the forms that come of illness that present in tertiary care centers may uh, have a skewed severity. Um, but this is probably a much more common illness than we recognize. Uh, patients go undiagnosed for years um, uh, with this illness. And I think the burden of this uh, disease on, on patients uh, can't be understated. Um, you know, think about how disruptive it would be to have acute onset of unrelenting retching, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, um, even leading to ER visits that presents unpredictably, disrupts family life, work life, um, you know, about a quarter of CVS patients become disabled um, because of it. Uh, you know, this is really a, a pretty effective uh, a, 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 a disease that really affects people's uh, lives. And so um, with that kind of background, uh, you know, I've had an increasing interest in this disorder from kind of a scientific perspective, you know, what is the pathophysiologic basis of CVS? Um, we can have a separate debate about that, and that's not really the point of our discussion, but, you know, ultimately this probably is a neural disease. Um, is my conjecture about this illness. And it's widely recognized that a, good, a sizable proportion of adults with CVS have um, anxiety uh, that's present. And the question has always become, you know, is it anxiety because of the illness? Is it anxiety premorbid that develop, if someone develops CVS later? The relationship between anxiety and CVS is very tightly linked. And the impetus for the study that we did is um, the recognition that a lot of um, people with CVS fear the next attack. I would if I had this disorder. Fortunately, I don't. Um, but not just the not knowing when this is going to happen again um, is in it in of itself anxiety provoking. Any intermittent really bad thing that can befall someone is inherently anxiety provoking. And so it could very well be that the quality of life impact of having CVS 
may be linked to the actual attack frequency and how burdensome those attacks may be sending people to the ER, but it could also be just the fact of having CVS or having some cognitive factor susceptibility to just being not able to handle unknown things and intolerance to uncertainty, so to speak, which we'll talk about, um, that could that mediate some of the quality of life burden, at least on a mental health level. Um, and so that was kind of the impetus for the study. Um, I'm always interested in kind of mind-body interactions and the role of mood disorders in mediating the experience of an illness and maybe even the actual expression of an illness. Um, uh, and I think this was a, a kind of our foray into this field. Great, and thank, thanks for that uh, mm -hmm. you know, introduction and also setting it up uh, for, for our audience to understand why it was important mm -hmm. to study this area. But you also set up um, um, the aim of your study quite well. So you know, if you could briefly uh, tell mm -hmm. us you sort of uh, what was your hypothesis going into the study uh, before you started? Sure. So, um, so first of all, I, I, I want to, uh, before we get too far into it, I, I really want to thank one of my colleagues, uh, Athangam Venkatesan, who, who at the time was uh, at uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, um, who's really a leader in this field, um, and uh, without with whom this, this study could not happen. Um, uh, Thangum has now moved to um, Ohio State University um, and is just starting there. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the aims of the study was really based on clinical experience with um, managing CVS patients, which I do a lot, um, and I'm really part of a larger group that's, you know, focused on CVS uh, research, where patients really um, pretty explicitly say, you know, I, I just the fear of the next attack is really, really kind of freaks me out. You know, I don't know when this is going to happen. Um, you know, I can relate to that a little bit. Um, you know, as a clinician, you're holding the pager when you're on call. You know, if someone said you're going to be called at 2 a.m. specifically, um, and that's the only call you're going to get, I could deal with that. But not knowing uh, when you're going to get called, even if everything was okay at the end of a call night, you know, it's interesting just, you know, being on the hook for something intermittently about to happen. So um, the psychologic profile of the not knowing, I was looking it up, and it turns out there's this cognitive construct called intolerance to uncertainty, um, which isn't a disorder if you have high amounts of that. It's just a personality kind of trait, a cognitive style. Um, some people can roll with not knowing what's going to happen, and some people can't. Um, and it turns out that high levels of that trait, intolerance to uncertainty, really tracks kind of transdiagnostically with a susceptibility to anxiety disorders, um, and, uh, you know, kind of other medical illnesses. And it's never really been looked at in any gastrointestinal illness that I could see. And so it really presented this golden opportunity in my mind to say, okay, we have a disease that is the perfect model of an intermittent, really bad thing, you know, an anticipatory anxiety that patients often express. Um, we should look at that. And does that actually predict quality of life? And so I approached, so, the, so the, basically the aim of the study was to measure using this metric that's been well validated, this IU or intolerance to uncertainty um, uh, construct. It's a very quick survey, 12 questions, um, and it's been looked at in any number of things in the kind of the psychology and, and psychiatry literature. Um, I approached uh, my colleague Thangam Venkatesan, who has a very large um, kind of database of patients that she's been following for a long time, and um, we could capture a lot of patients in a cross-sectional way and send out this survey um, asking patients about their illness, how long they've had that, um, uh, had CVS, their kind of burden of um, events, do they visit the ER, cognitive uh, questions uh, and uh, emotional screening questions about anxiety, um, but then also this IU um, instrument. And we were able to capture over 100 uh, CVS patients, which for the list literature is actually a pretty decent sample size. So the, the whole uh, point of the study was to measure IU in, in, intolerance to uncertainty um, and quality of life metrics and disease characteristics of patients and see if higher levels of IU predicted higher levels of or poorer levels of quality of life. Um, uh, yeah, that's basically it. So there's a cross-sectional design of a study. I think you're mute. Uh, can I hear you, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I, I think uh, uh, I hit the mute button by mistake. But, okay. um, you know, as you um, describe these methodologies, um, it's laid off, you know, very well in terms of what you did to get this data. Uh, mm -hmm. But can you outline the key findings from this study for us? Sure. Thank you. Right. So, um, you know, there are a couple of different uh, things that we wanted to accomplish. First of all, this is one of the larger data sets. Um, just to document some factors about patients' experience of CVS. I'm very kind of proud of that. It, it, it adds a little bit to the literature. Um, it, this was kind of a side topic, but um, you know, one of the findings were um, you know, what proportion of people experience a, a prodrome, for example, before their attack. Um, understanding a little bit about the um, uh, kind of the chronobiologic aspect of this, you know, the circadian pattern to CVS. So we asked a lot of questions just to kind of round out some understanding of uh, CVS illness in a decent subset of people. Um, but the major top line finding was uh, really that uh, patients had um, a wide range of intolerance to uncertainty trait, you know, as quantified by this scale. And the scale goes from 12 to 60, and it's less important about the numbers, but there's a cutoff of where you can kind of dichotomize these groups into people that have a high level of a trait uh, intolerance to uncertainty, and people have less of that. And so we basically split the um, entire study sample into the high and low um, categories. And when you look at that, um, clearly the um, average quality of life metrics as you, um, as, as measured by the PROMISE tools, um, showed a, a significant gap in uh, quality of life with poorer levels of quality of life in those that had high intolerance to uncertainty trait um, uh, compared to those that didn't. And the interesting thing in my mind is that when we actually looked at the rates of um, CVS attacks, their frequency, their severity, the burden on healthcare utilization in terms of ER use um, uh, and, and hospitalizations, that was not different between those two groups. So the quality of life impact, which you know, a priori you would have thought that, of course, someone who's in the hospital all the time would have a poorer quality of life. Head to head, these groups were not different. The only difference was um, the intolerance to uncertainty and that predicted a lower quality of life. So I think the burden of this illness is not just in its frequency, which is what everyone usually talks about. How, how often do you have attacks? How long are they? Are you in the ER? You really have to take into consideration the psychological toll that having an illness like this has on somebody. And IU, this intolerance to uncertainty, seems like a cognitive trait that may predict someone being more susceptible or vulnerable to this uncertain disease in terms of just not knowing when it's going to come. Um, that's, an, that's a burden that affects you all the time because you, you're, you're fearing the next event. Um, so I think that's some insight. And the reason why it's important that we found that is that that's a malleable cognitive trait. So when you go to a psychologist for cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, we kind of think of this as this black box thing that happens, you know, you go to a psychologist and they do their CBT, right? But, you know, part of that is to really identify what cognition is, is really getting people stuck. Um, and internal intolerance to uncertainty can be altered by cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's possible that patients that have CVS could benefit, some, some subset perhaps, um, could specifically benefit from CBT. Um, so I think that's one kind of take, uh, you know, take away from this. That's a little conjecture on my part to say what would be a best treatment, but I think this sets the stage for looking at treatment effects or at least identifying subgroups of patients that could benefit. Great. Okay. And so, you know, I, I, I was going to ask you um, how this might impact your practice or, or, you know, if you think that this has implications for patient care, which you sort of alluded to that, that, you know, it might help uh, in terms of the approach somebody would take with cognitive behavioral therapy when treating these patients. Mm -hmm. um, but you also ended with saying that, that it's somewhat conjecture. So, you know, uh, I'll end, you know, towards the end, I wanted to ask you, how do you think this would set the stage for future work or future research in this mm -hmm. area um, to go from uh, conjecture to being more sure about what we should be doing for these patients? Uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry, I've kind of anticipated some of your questions and rolled them into uh, long, long winded answers. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I think uh, you're, it's a great question the way you just asked that. So, we have so much that we need to establish in this field um, for in CVS. Um, 
the clinical guideline document that I was a part of um, the committee for creating the, the first adult guide, clinical guideline um, for treatment and diagnosis of CVS, um, we spent a bit of time talking about this issue of kind of psychosocial health and, and interventions. And the data actually is fairly thin from a therapeutic trial perspective. Um, intuitively, it certainly can't hurt and it likely helps, um, but the data to support that is pretty, pretty thin. Um, I think we need more trials uh, in, in this space. And so, you know, a trial to do cognitive behavioral therapy um, for cyclic vomiting syndrome patients, I think would be wonderful. Um, I think we need that. Um, I don't know what the effect size would be. Um, so we, we, we really need to kind of do those trials. But my prediction would be that if we did those trials, we should, probably should know something about the patients that are enrolled. We always do these trials in, in GI where we just take everyone with a diagnosis and we give them the same um, you know, kind of therapy and then we look at the, the effect. Um, I think something like intolerance to uncertainty might be a good screening tool. You know, maybe you really want to capture the people that have high levels of that specifically or something like that. You know, you, you know, as someone who's much more highly likely to respond in a very specific way to cognitive behavioral therapy. So I would love to do a trial like that. Um, so that would be kind of the next step. Um, you know, the, the guidelines suggest that we should employ mind-body techniques, uh, you know, relaxation therapies, CBT. Um, again, this is a very prevalent, highly prevalent anxious, there's a high prevalence of anxiety in this population, and I think that should be targeted in of itself. Um, and I think our study really highlights the idea that quality of life could be impacted significantly for the better by addressing those issues. So uh, stay tuned for more work in this field. Yeah. Great. And that that's really exciting. You know, uh, I think it's it's nice that uh, we're moving the ball forward um, in this um, important but still uh, less recognized condition. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Levi Leventhal for the excellent paper and assisting in the podcast this month. And I'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning in. I look forward to welcoming you again next month with another exciting article. Thanks, uh, David. Okay, thank you, Perna. Bye-bye.